Thanks. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, I'm a product manager at Braintree, um, but my background actually is I went to school for design. Uh, Braintree is actually the fourth startup I've been a part of uh, in my career, and usually the position that I've had as I joined startups was as the first designer slash front end developer, duck build platypus kind of guy. So I've kind of been part of every different part of the, the software development design process, and I'm still pretty involved with design at Braintree as well. So I've got a little bit of an intro uh, about what Braintree is, but folks that really aren't familiar, it's a payments platform, just makes it really easy for developers to accept payments in their websites or on mobile apps. And we get to work with really amazing companies, including some of the ones we heard about from here already today, like GitHub and Uber or Airbnb or Living Social. When you buy anything from those companies, um, we actually store all the credit card payment information securely, connect with all the banks, do all that stuff, which is makes all that stuff happen. Um, we also have a peer-to-peer -peer payments app called Venmo, um, and Venmo is really just an easy way to pay your friends for things like splitting a cab fare or squaring up for the check at the end of a meal or even doing things like paying for rent. So you may be using that too. But I'm not here to talk about the stuff that I work on every day today. Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been exploring for the last year or so, which is UX anti-patterns. Um, and for folks that aren't familiar with the notion of patterns and anti-patterns, design patterns was something I started learning about with all the great engineers that I've worked with um, in my career. And the basic notion of a design pattern, usually as it's applied by developers, is this notion of taking a technical solution um, that can kind of be turned into a template and then used over and over again as a starting point for solving types of problems that are similar to each other. Um, and those patterns uh, exist in the interactive and digital design world as well. So just as a quick example of a design pattern, um, anybody who's booked uh, travel has probably come across this little widget here um, as a way to choose your departure date and your, or your uh, departure and arrival dates. Um, and it's become this pretty common thing. If you go to any travel site and want to book your travel, this is probably the widget that you're going to use to pick the dates for your travel. Or indeed, if you're going into any sort of reporting applications at this point, it's become kind of the standard way to choose a range of dates. Um, so it's become an established design pattern. Somebody figured it out at one point, the idea spread, and it's a good thing that users are familiar with now. So that's an example of a uh, design pattern. And I started writing, exploring this topic on my blog and writing out some examples of UX anti-patterns that I'd found. And I was talking to one of the developers I work with, and he said, oh yeah, I've been enjoying that. He's like, it's really fun to point out when people are doing it wrong on the internet. Um, which is true, it can be fun to do that. And this morning I think I laughed as hard as anybody when we were going through the uh, uh, Pepsi branding example, which was pretty painful and hilarious. And we're gonna go through some things here actually um, that are UX anti-patterns, but one of the things that's important for me as a designer, uh, knowing that I always look back on my own work and always cringe a little bit, um, all the examples I'm going to use today are from products and services and apps that I love and I use every day. That's how I come across these UX anti-patterns. So none of the examples I'm using are things that were designed poorly. Um, there are things that I discovered that are mistakes that I and designers I work with make um, and also that are in all the products and, and services that I use. Um, the other thing I would say about the UX uh, about anti-patterns is, you know, sometimes when you come across something, it's just designed poorly or it's not designed at all. But anti-patterns are actually something that's really specific. And to be an anti-pattern, it's not just poorly designed. It has to really meet two criteria when I'm, when I'm looking at these. Um, and the qualifications to be an anti-pattern are, it has to appear to be beneficial at first. Uh, it can't be just something that's uh, poorly designed for usability. It's something that a designer or somebody somewhere along the way thought, hey, I'm gonna do something good for the user here. Um, but it created some unintended consequences that weren't expected. Um, and then the second is that there has to be a better solution available that's demonstrable and repeatable. Um, there are just really hard UI problems out there that nobody's figured out yet, um, but it's not really an anti-pattern if there's no good pattern that you can fall back on uh, to replace it. So for starters, I'm gonna use this little click here example as just an idea of an anti-pattern. Um, PayPal, actually I had this in my, in my talk before we were uh, acquired recently, but again, an example of great products that I'm, I'm using every day. Um, but the click here anti-pattern was something that I think we're seeing a little bit less of, um, but it's just an example of something where along the way it became a thing to say, I wanna draw attention to this link somehow, so I'm gonna say click here and make it really obvious that this is something that can be clicked on. So there was an intention here to serve the user, but as a unintended consequence of that it ends up not really serving the user because there's no actual kind of content that's being described there. It's just kind of mystery meat 
only looking at this piece here that um, says click here. You won't really know what happens when you click on that. As a user, you're not going to know where you're going to be taken to. Um, and maybe a better approach there would be something that would be a button or something would indicate there's an action to be taken or perhaps changing the content of what that link is to be something that explains where you're going to. So just a, li a little bit of a, an anti-pattern there um, as an example to get started. Um, and we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at some of the other uh, UX anti-patterns that I've been exploring and thinking about um, online and in mobile apps. So one of the fun things about patterns and anti-patterns is they all have to have cute names. And there's some better ones and some worse ones in here. But I've, I've done my best to apply some names or to find them where I can. So the first one I want to talk about here I call the double jump. Um, it's one of my personal favorites. And uh, if you take a look at the um, uh, phone number field that's on screen here on the Southwest Notifications uh, dialog on, from their website, it's become pretty common practice on a lot of websites, especially to take phone numbers and split them up into three fields. And I think the notion there usually is to enforce some formatting that the server is expecting on the other side, because they want to make sure that you're not getting parens and dashes or whatever it's pluses, other sorts of things that might be, uh, that a user might think about entering into that field. So somewhere along the way, somebody says, all right, let's split this up into three fields. But one of the problems with that is that users don't normally think of a phone number as three distinct pieces of information. You think about it as one piece of information. It's a phone number. Um, so to get around that, a lot of sites also employ this little trick where as soon as you've entered in the first three numbers into a phone number, it jumps you to the second field. But if you're like me and you're hammering through a form really quick, especially with information that you know really well like your phone number, I always hit the tab key just at the exact same moment as it's skipping me to the second field. And I end up in this situation where I'm in the third field actually entering in the second portion of my phone number. And then I got to hit delete and use my mouse and get back to the previous field. Um, and it's a pretty frustrating experience. So again, there was sort of a good intention here, which was I'm going to make sure that I get formatting together and I don't have to throw an error to a user and tell them how to reformat this. But there's this unintended consequence that happens uh, when the user finds himself in this position where they, they've got to go reach for their mouse instead of just keep typing. So what would be the demonstrable pattern that you could use instead of this? Um, the good news is that now we're living in this grand age of JavaScript wizardry. We can do all sorts of stuff in the browser now that we used to not be able to do. Um, and we can sort of take a lesson from the way that iOS and the iPhone started to um, just format phone numbers on the fly as you type them in. Uh, so as an example, Southwest could just have one field here that as you started to type in the phone number and put the information in, it added in the formatting as you go. And I've actually seen this now um, on another website. Uh, I was updating some stuff from Comcast uh, as I was moving over the summer and found I did have a field that did just this. As I started to type my phone number into it, it just started formatting things for me. So in this case, we can uh, kind of serve two purposes. One, put the information uh, collection in a format that a user would think about, one piece of data, uh, but also be using some script on the client side to make sure that we're formatting that data in a way that's going to be clean when it gets to the server. So we end up with happy humans and happy robots. and then we're all happy. Um, also point out that phone numbers aren't the only place that I've seen this anti-pattern out there. Other places where there's like really highly formatted types of information, especially things like social security number um, and other things that contain dashes and other types of punctuation in them are other places where I see forms that try to split this data up. But I think the same pattern can be employed in all those cases to kind of clean that up, that experience with a better pattern. So the next one I want to explore here is the door slam, which is a better name because I stole it. I think that this one actually came from Errol Balkin, the um, English designer. Um, and I think this is probably another one that people will be pretty familiar with. And you're kind of in your Twitter feed or you're in your inbox going through email and somebody sent you a link that you want to click on. You're like, that looks like a good idea. Conan O'Brien's written something funny on LinkedIn again. I want to see what that's all about. So you click the link, expecting to read a funny article from Conan O'Brien, but instead you get this thing here and it says, hey, Download our app. And again, there's probably a great intention behind this when it happens. And I guess the thinking is usually, you know, we as an organization, as a team, have put a ton of effort into building this great app. If we get our, anybody who wants to visit our website onto our app, they're going to have a much better experience because we think our app is a better experience than our website. But unfortunately, by putting this interstitial step in um, before the user gets to the content, right at the point where they're just becoming interested in being engaged with you, is a pretty harsh way to uh, introduce them to the site. Instead, I think it feels a lot more like this. <coughs> just slamming a door on the user's face right at the point where they really want to get to know you and engage with you. So what might be a better way to go about this? Oh, I missed a slide there. There we go. Um, I think 
The better pattern for being able to guide users to a native app, if you think that's going to be a better experience, is to first get them to the content, serve the user by serving up the thing that they asked to see in the first place. But then, once the user's had a chance to engage with that and say, you know what, I found some value here, this has been a good experience for me, then you can present them with the option to say, I, wanna, I, I care about this enough to have this on my, on my phone full time. So particularly on iOS, there's a widget from Apple that's built right into Safari that you can use. You can include a little bit of code at the top of your website, and it'll actually be a link to your app in the App Store. Um, so I think this is one good option. Um, I also was thinking about a little bit from Jared Spool's uh, talk this morning, where he was talking through getting to the bottom of the content and then serving up uh, an ad that's highly targeted to the bottom of that content. I think there are opportunities to do the same thing here, where once a user's had a chance to see what they came to see, it's an ideal sort of time at the end of their flow to actually present them with the opportunity to go link to your app and, and, and download that for your phone. Interestingly enough, Glassdoor actually employs <laughs> both. Uh, they've got a door slam, and then they've got the opportunity to download. Um, I don't know if they've got some data to show some reasoning behind that, or if it's just some, some conflicting things there, but it was interesting to me to see both, both patterns employed there. So next up, we'll talk about the teaser. Uh, this was one that I first came across uh, thinking about it when Google Maps for iOS came out, which I was so happy to get because I'd been living without public transit directions in Chicago for the entire time after the iOS 6 update on Maps. So I was so excited to get the Google Maps app. It was probably the most anticipated app I've ever put on my phone. And I got it out, I tried it. The first thing I was going to do was to get some uh, public transit directions, popped in the office, and then touched on the little pin the way I'd been trained to touch on the pin and every other map app I'd ever used. And this little thing happened where, if you didn't see it, it just kind of bounced up and down there at the bottom to get further information and to get directions. And it was trying to hint at me, the app, to swipe up from the bottom of the screen to get access to that further information. And I'm guessing that the Google designers were trying to employ a pattern that Apple had used on the lock screen uh, that had gotten a lot of attention and, and positive attention um, for getting to the camera, where if you touch the little camera button, it would kind of bounce up and down and encourage you to swipe upward. And Apple rightly got a lot of praise for that because it makes a lot of sense to hint at the user to do that because if from the lock screen on your phone, you want that to be a really intentional action to bring a user out of that lock screen. Otherwise, you'd end up with lots of pictures of the inside of your pocket or the inside of your purse or other embarrassing things. Um, but in this case, it didn't need to be intentional. I think that the user was showing pretty clearly their intention by touching on the tab um, and really just wanted to get further information from that. It's a way that they'd already been used. It was a pattern they'd come to expect. And to Google's credit, in a further update of the app, it's been a while now, actually, they did update this behavior um, to give the user what they wanted. So iterative development, software development for the win. Um, but I think, in general here, this anti-pattern can actually be extrapolated out to a little bit of a higher level to just any time I think you find yourself trying to offer a hint to a user about how they should properly be interacting with your user interface, that's probably a uh, moment to take a step back and pause and think, well, if I have to provide a hint in some way here, then maybe I just need to actually do what the user expects at this, at this point. Next up, uh, I'm gonna take a look at a, another mobile uh, UX anti-pattern, thumb stretcher, and I don't know if the rest of you, like me, have started to get to a point where on days of heavy phone usage, especially when I'm traveling, my right thumb actually starts to get sore. Um, I have to like switch over to go left-handed for a while to give my right, my right thumb a break. Um, and this is an anti-pattern that can kind of exacerbate that a little bit. Um, so Planet Money app, totally awesome, total aside here. If anybody doesn't listen to uh, NPR's Planet Money podcast or read their blog, economics sounds like the most boring thing in the world. They make it super accessible, super interesting uh, as designers. Uh, looking for ways to kind of bust out of the mold and learn about some new things. I couldn't recommend this enough. Um, it's a great app. Um, and it employs a design pattern that I think is starting to become pretty common in mobile apps and mobile websites, which is that little menu button up in the corner there. You touch on that and you get this cool little tray. It's a great pattern because it hides a lot of the noise, navigation, and cruft that would otherwise take up screen real estate when a user wants to interact with content. Um, it's a pretty cool thing. I think the first time I saw it was on Facebook's app, actually, and it spread pretty, pretty widely after that. So nothing wrong with this. It's a great pattern that's serving a good usage. But I think the interesting thing about the placement of that little button at the top, which we usually call the hamburger stack at my office. I don't know if there's an official name for that thing yet, the three little lines that go across. Um, forever stack. What's that? I'm sorry, forever stack. Hamburger stack, yeah. <laughs> 
So we, we, we prefer to have the hamburger stack, and oftentimes you'll see it up in the upper left corner, which makes a lot of sense if you're coming from a place of traditional graphic design or even um, website design. Upper left corner for Western readers is the pride of placement position. Uh, it's where usually you start scanning the page, interacting with the page from uh, left to right, top to bottom. Uh, it makes sense to put an important navigational feature there. But where that becomes problematic in a mobile context um, is in how you actually uh, approach a phone. So these are actually a couple slides I stole from uh, Luke Rabluski, who we heard from this morning, from his talk that he actually gave here at, on this stage last year at Warm Gun, um, where he was talking about the posture at which you actually go to approach a phone, which for most users on a mobile device that's a handheld device is one-handed, and for 80 or 90% of the population, that's gonna mean with the right hand. And we can see that that maps to some zones on the screen of a mobile device that are easier or harder to reach with your thumb. And if you think about where the hamburger was hanging out there on the Planet Money app and on lots of other ones, it's way up there in the upper corner uh, in the yellow zone, which is really hard to reach for a really important piece of navigational um, controls in the app. So luckily the answer to this one is a pretty simple one. And the better pattern to employ here is to keep the hamburger stack around, but just flip sides on it. Um, put it in a spot that's much easier to access for the majority of users. So I've got here actually the Braintree blog. Uh, that's a responsive website. Uh, Seth Godin's uh, blog as well. He's got like a four-line hamburger stack. That might be like a Big Mac as opposed to like a Whopper that we've got going on the other side. Um, but in both cases, it's in the upper right corner, which is still pride of placement. It's the top of the screen. It's easy to access. Um, but for most users, it's going to be in a spot that's much easier to reach than the, the upper left corner. So we've gone through a bunch of examples here from a bunch of great apps, um, things that I use uh, all the time, uh, well-designed things, great products. But all of them still contain these hiccups, these anti-patterns that are out there. Um, so how do they get there? How do these things persist in the wild? Um, if there's one thing that I've learned from the whole healthcare.gov debacle is that at this point we can blame everything that's wrong on the internet on the current administration. Um, maybe not, actually. Uh, the truth is it, it, it's us. Uh, we're the ones who are building all of this stuff. Um, we are the people who are designing, building, shipping, all the things that we're using every day, all the folks in this room. And the good news is that we can take a step back on a lot of these things and help to make it better. Um, I think the important things as we're approaching the designs for our apps and our websites is to not be afraid of patterns. That's not my hope with this talk. Patterns are super useful things. They allow you to really stand on the shoulders of giants, be able to get the good benefit of the good work and, and research that other designers and developers have done, um, and be able to ship things a lot quicker. But I think the thing I'd like to encourage is for all of us as designers and developers to not reach for that very first pattern that we think of, the one that seems obvious, the first solution that we think is gonna solve uh, a particular problem for us. And to especially be aware of when the patterns that we're reaching for are ones that we're used to seeing in a different context, especially as we're seeing so many things shift to mobile at this point. Um, I mean, mobile is really eating the world. Um, and it's forcing us to reconsider a lot of the designs and a lot of the things that we're building in a new context. And so as we see things like the shift for what's pride of placement for a UI uh, button, um, something that I think started, like I said, with uh, Facebook, or if we're looking at the Google app, the interesting thing about that is I know a lot of us here are coming from a startup context, and with the shift to mobile, it's a brave new world for everybody. Um, we're really in the early innings on, on mobile in general. So we also can't really just take the easy and safe route of looking to what Apple or Google or Facebook or anybody the giants are doing either, um, because they're all still figuring everything out for the first time too. So a little bit of that safety net of being able to kind of take the crib notes from some of the uh, bigger players, the designers that we normally would look to and respect, those opportunities aren't gonna be there. But the other great thing about that though, on the flip side, is that it's a really exciting time for us as designers because the playing field has really been leveled as well. We can be working out, just like anybody else in the industry, some of the great new design patterns that could be the things that are going to make for great experiences on mobile and elsewhere in everything that we do going forward. Um, it's really an opportunity uh, in an unprecedented way for all of us to start to rethink these experiences, how they relate on mobile and on everything that we do.
So thanks for letting me share a few of these things with you. If you're interested in learning a little bit more, I'm MB Boki, just about everywhere um, online, on the Twitters and elsewhere. Uh, if you're interested in more about what Braintree does, check us out at Braintree Payments. Thank you. Thanks.